He worked long, hard days that fall, pushing himself from sunup to sundown to get the cabin finished. Providence was kind and good weather held out until late in the fall. Still, he rested every Sabbath and found time to walk the many miles to a small log church to worship. We shall sing together, Come Thou Fount. It goes, Come Thou Fount of every blessing, to my heart to sing Thy grace. Mm -hmm. Come Thou Fount of Hymn books were few, and so it was common for the minister to line out a hymn. When the congregation had learned it, they would then sing it all together. Call for songs of loudest praise. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount, I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Praise the mount, I'm fixed upon it, mount of The sermon for that day was Jonathan Edwards' Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God from 1741. It was a powerful message, well delivered, and he thought much upon it for his own soul. For even one moment, your care of your own life and, and the means that you use for your own preservation, but indeed these things are nothing. For if God should withdraw his hand, they would avail no more to keep you from falling than the thin air to hold up a person that is suspended in it. And it is nothing but the mere pleasure of God and that of an angry God without any promise or obligation at all that keeps the arrow one moment from being drunk with your blood. Thus all you that never passed unto a great change of heart by the mighty power of the Spirit of God upon your souls, all you that were never born again and made new creatures and raised from being dead to sin into a state of new and before altogether unexperienced light and life are in the hands of an angry God. 
However, you may have reformed your life in many things and, and may have had religious affections and may keep up some form of religion in your families and in your closets and in the house of God. It is nothing but the mere pleasure, His mere pleasure, that keeps you from being this moment swallowed up into everlasting destruction. After the sermon, they filed out of the church one by one, each one greeting the minister and shaking his hand in gratitude for his excellent delivery. Good message, Parson. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you so much for your kind words. You are, are unfamiliar to me. Uh, what's your name? James Bender. Mr. Bender, well, well welcome Thank to you. our service today. Uh, well, where have you come here from? I've moved up from the Tennessee country, come to the Ohio to settle a homestead and bring my family up. Wonderful, wonderful. Good, strong folk down there in Tennessee. We need you up here to settle this land. Tell me, Sue, are you, a, are you a man of faith? Are you a believer? I am indeed. Indeed, wonderful, wonderful. Um, I don't mean to pry, but are you literate? I am. I can read. You can read? Wonderful. Yes, sir. Um, well, I was recently in Philadelphia, and our synod, the Presbyterian Synod, gifted me with several copies of the Scripture uh, that we may use to give as gifts to those who might make use of them, who would be able to read them, and uh, well, I have one, and if you're interested, if you would like it, I would like to gift it to you. Would you like that? Would you receive that from me? It would please me very much, sir. I would love to have a copy of the scriptures. Well, wonderful. Well, it's my pleasure. For you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this. I will treasure this, sir. I pray that you will. Much obliged. God bless you. God bless you, man. Thank you, sir. Uh, see you again soon. You will. The days passed quickly, and he continued to work feverishly on the cabin and continue his preparations to head back home. He was still working as a carpenter in Masseyville and had been able to establish deep friendships with many in the town, including the blacksmith and a merchant family by the name of Joyce. The Joyce family regularly operated flatboats from Pittsburgh to many points on the Ohio. Mrs. Joyce was recently widowed and her husband had been a fine maker of rifle guns and powder horns. It was through this connection that he was able to obtain much of the furnishings for his cabin as well as enough planks from the dismantled flatboats to make fine and solid flooring. Also, by effecting many repairs on the blacksmith's cabin, barn, and shop, he had been fully supplied with all the nails and ironwork to make his cabin safe from weather, animals, and man. Occasionally, he went back by the bark wagiwam. For some time now, he had been sleeping in the safety of the cabin. The Wegiwam was empty and now falling apart for want of attention. No wild animals had taken up abode there and after peering inside and satisfied that no unwelcome guest was dwelling in his vicinity, he passed on into the forest on yet another journey into town. Today, he would be picking up more iron nails so that he might finish the porch floor and roof. The cabin was looking fine to his estimation and he was glad to be finished riving out shingles and to be finishing the porch roof.
it was one of those wonderfully warm days of Indian summer, and he was grateful for the reprieve. They had yet to have more than just a skiff of snow, but the mornings and nights have been quite cold of late. Finally, the cabin was finished. He had put up a canvas at one end to shelter his hand cart. Someday, there would be a lean-to added to this side. But for now, this would have to do. As a matter of habit, he paused on the porch to scan the creek and the surrounding area for any sign of trouble. His wife would be pleased at having real glass windows. Why, with four panes of glass, they would almost be considered wealthy by their neighbors. Also with the help of a neighbor, George, from some miles away, who was an experienced stonemason, they had built a fine fireplace and chimney. Rocks were plentiful in the creek and there was much limestone in the area to make a proper mortar. Now it was time to disrobe and prepare for bed. He had banked a good log in the fire before leaving, and fortunately there were still plenty of embers. He had close cropped his hair because of a lice infestation and had grown to rather like it, so he kept it that way. The fire was putting forth good heat in the chill evening and once again he was glad for George and his friend William for helping him construct such a fine stone fireplace and hearth. He was also filled with gratitude to Widow Joyce and her fine family, so generously helping him with the cabin furnishings. Using a sliver of wood from the fireplace, he lit a candle to stave off the gathering twilight. He was a mite hungry, and a few hickory nuts and a bit of cream from the neighbor's cow would help him fall asleep.
using the candle wick scissors. He dipped the wick into the liquid wax, extinguishing the flame, and repriming the wick with wax for the next lighting. Then it was up the ladder, into the loft, and onto the rope bed for a good night's rest. Morning dawned upon him, and it was a gray and cloudy day. The straw tick on bottom and the feather tick on top made for fine sleeping. The 14-star quilt had been a gift from Widow Joyce for his new home and represented Vermont, her home state, which had joined the Union of States in 1791, just a few years prior. After rising, he smoothed out the bed. This would be the last time he slept in it until he returned with the family the next year, and he wanted the place to be as neat as a pin when they saw it. there were still a few coals in the fireplace. And so he busied himself with rekindling it. Soon the fire was blazing again, and he was glad for the warmth in the chill morning air. He had constructed a cedar Bible box, and now, as had become his morning ritual, he read a passage from the scriptures. He was still amazed at the valuable gift from the parson, and turned it about in his hands, admiring the fine leather binding. Sing unto the Lord a new song, for he hath done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm hath gotten him the victory. The Lord hath made known his salvation. His righteousness hath he openly showed in the sight of the heathen. He hath remembered his mercy and his truth toward the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the earth. Make a loud noise and rejoice and sing praise. Sing unto the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the voice of a song. With trumpets and sound of cornet, make a joyful noise before the Lord their King. Let the sea roar and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein. Let the floods clap their hands, let the hills be joyful together before the Lord, for he cometh to judge the earth with righteousness, shall he judge the world and the people with equity. Today's reading from Psalm 98 seemed especially appropriate. This new nation was indeed a reason to be glad and sing. The Almighty had been merciful to him many times, saving him from foes, ill weather, and many misfortunes. Now it was time for a bite of breakfast before he hit the trail.
it was also a good morning for some hot, sweet chocolate. He still had a little butter, and he figured to use it up before he left. As of yet, he had no oven, but a fried bread was nearly as good, and he looked forward to it. He also thought it good to finish the cream, and it did go well with the chocolate.
He lit the candles from the fireplace and placed them in the shaving mirror. He started to reach for the dipper, but remember there was still water in the pitcher. The razor was one that he'd had since his days as a soldier in the Revolution, and he kept it stropped and sharp. He'd grown tired of shaving some years ago, and even though it wasn't the style of the day, he decided to keep his beard. Well, everything was cleaned up, and it was time to get ready to depart. His trousers had been getting pretty threadbare in spots, and so he had traded for a pair of buckskin pants for the trip home just in case. Once more, he carefully checked the powder in the pan. It was well primed and ready to go. He surveyed his surroundings and all was quiet. So he set the flint lock to one side and brought in the large timber saw for safekeeping.
His river friend, Mr. Justice, had promised to keep an eye on things in his absence, and he was not a little comforted by that fact. And now, a final prayer for his safety and for a swift journey back to Tennessee and to his family. He left the fire to smolder out as there was no risk of a cabin fire in the well-built stone chimney. The Joyce family had told him of some cousins of theirs down in Kentucky that were getting ready to flatboat down the Cumberland and that he might fetch a ride with them should the weather hold out and he could arrive in time. It was late in the season being the second week of December, but they were determined to go, weather permitting. His trip through the forest and waving bluegrass of Cane Tiki was uneventful. He and Mr. Justice had easily crossed the Ohio at a ford and had parted ways at Kenton Station, just south of Limestone. The Cumberland River flowed all the way from mid-Kentucky to the region of Fort Nashboro, then on to the Ohio, the Mississippi, and finally the Gulf at New Orleans. This would shorten his trip home by weeks to just a few days. Now, he arrived at a bluff overlooking the Cumberland River and its plateau. He sure hoped he wasn't late and that this was the proper place he'd been told from which they were launching the flatboat. Sure enough, they were still there and still loading up their goods. My name's James Bender. I'm from up in the Ohio country, headed back home. I'm seeking passage south on the Cumberland. How far are you going? I need to go as far as Nashboro. All right, we're going all the way to the Ohio. Are you willing to work? I am. You willing to pay it all? I have some cash money. How about your labor and $2? Two dollars seems fair. It's a deal. As he was clambering aboard, they told him that they had a newspaper that he might read, recently come from Boston.
He immediately looked for any news from Virginia, but it was scant news from his boyhood home to read. He often wondered how his parents and siblings were faring. He had arrived at the boat none too soon, as that afternoon they shoved off and headed downstream. The journey was peaceful and uneventful, and within the week, they had made it to the vicinity of Fort Nashboro. Thank you. God bless you, James Bender. Safe travels. Thank you, sir. Godspeed. And in such a manner, they had parted ways and the boatmen continued their trip downriver. He spent the first night with an old friend around Fort Nashboro and left his pack and bedroll there to be picked up at a later date so that he might travel the 12 miles as quickly as possible to his loved ones. Meanwhile, back at the borrowed cabin, his family continued their daily existence, hoping and praying for his soon return. They had been able to post a few letters back and forth, and he had assured them that he would do his utmost to be home by Christmas, and hopefully before the weather turned foul. youngest, Molly, was supposed to be spinning, but instead was taking the time to play with her treasured doll, a gift from her grandmother. Now it was Catherine's turn. She dearly loved animals, but especially horses, and her grandfather had skillfully carved one for her.
Molly, Catherine, I'm going hunting. Yes, Elizabeth, be careful. Please bring home a big fat rabbit. I'll do the best I can. Now say your prayers so we can get some good meat for our table. As she walked away, Elizabeth was ever mindful of the responsibility that lay upon her. Even though Mr. M was kind to them and brought over an occasional bit of pork or beef, the duty was hers to effectively hunt and waste no precious powder and lead in doing so. Back in the cabin, Abigail was busy cutting up the carrots and potatoes for the evening meal. When her husband had left for the Ohio country, they had only been in the borrowed cabin for a few days. Their former misfortune had been what had prompted him to go and seek a better position for them all. Now, with their belongings and some borrowed possessions, she had turned the bare and drafty cabin into a home. They might be poor, but the few books they had were well used, and all the children had been taught their letters and general ciphering. Father's shaving mug was still over the cabinet where he had left it, and her father's silhouette, who was a minister, hung on the wall to her right. Mr. M had yester morn brought over a cut of beef from the fall butchering, and she must cook all of it. And so she was making a rather large stew. Salt, a frontier necessity, must also be added. A few dried tomatoes would go well too.
It truly and surely felt good to be home at last. Fine water, but you should taste the water in the Ohio country. Sweet as sugar and better than honey. Come, Molly. You may finish that in a moment. Let us give thanks to our gracious Father for bringing us back in such a glorious reunion safe and sound after so long a time. Our gracious Father, we do not have words to express our extreme gratitude for bringing us back together and the dearness of this moment which shall be with us for many years to come. May we cherish one another, and may our partings from this day on be few. We ask all of these things in the name of your dear Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As Abigail ladled out the stew, he reflected on the many lonely meals he had eaten. His heart felt so full at that moment, he feared it might burst with joy. Darling, this is delicious, but I would like some salt. I found, I found the bones of a dead man. Been shot through the heart with an arrow. I was frightened, and I began to to hold my flintlock more tightly. And what I found was a a man. He was a Christian man, and and he had died from his wounds, and he had a small pistol in his pocket. And I got it. After supper, he regaled them with stories of his travels and his many adventures. What a beautiful land the Almighty has blessed us with. Let us thank Him once more 
for his providence in our lives. As the family once more joined hands, they each in their own way gave thanks to the divine providence of the Heavenly Father for his many blessings on their lives. And as they look forward to their new life in the Ohio country.